Welcome to Your Strata Property, the podcast for property owners looking for reliable, accurate and bite-sized information from an experienced and authoritative source. To access previous episodes and useful strata tips, go to www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. Hello and welcome. I'm Amanda Farmer and this is Your Strata Property. Gavin Beardsell is an investment manager based in the Sydney office of IMF Bentham. Gavin has over 20 years experience specialising in commercial litigation and class actions. Gavin was admitted to practice law in the UK in 1997 and gained valuable experience as a partner at the UK's largest insurance law firm, Berryman's Lace Moore. He acted for several of the UK's leading insurers and their clients in relation to high-value claims in the High Court of Justice and the Court of Appeal. Since 2008, Gavin has practised in Australia, first as a partner at Gilchrist Connell and then as a senior consultant at Clyde & Co, where he acted for insurers and large corporations, defending and advising on high-profile class actions brought by shareholders, debenture holders and other investors in the Federal Court of Australia and the Supreme Courts of New South Wales and Victoria. Gavin has a Bachelor of Laws with honours from Exeter University and a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the College of Law in England. Today, I am delighted to welcome Gavin Beardsell of IMF Bentham. Welcome, Gavin. Thanks, Amanda. Pleased to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Gavin, and our listeners have probably got a bit of a hint from the title to this podcast episode. We are going to talk about a very important piece of litigation that IMF Bentham is currently involved in that is impacting our apartment owners, residents and managers. We're definitely going to get stuck into that. But first of all, because some of our listeners may not have heard of IMF Bentham. Can you let us know what it is and what it is exactly that you do? Yes. So IMF Bentham is a a large company. It's listed on the Australian Securities Exchange. It's one of the largest litigation funders in Australia and indeed globally. In short, what IMF Bentham does, it provides funding and project management for significant and large-scale litigation including class actions and particularly class actions which enable large groups of people to collectively bring their claims together rather than pursuing them individually. And as part of our funding, we pay for the claimant's legal costs. We also provide cover for the defendant's legal costs if ultimately the action is unsuccessful. And another key part of our funding is that we provide security for costs, often where a large defendant wants some comfort of knowing that its costs will be paid if ultimately the class action is not successful for the claimants. And our project management services can be summed up by we have a nationwide team of investment managers, of which I'm one, and we also have a client liaison team based in Perth that provides assistance to the nationwide team of investment managers. Okay, so it is your funding that allows important, let's say, pieces of litigation to be brought before the courts by large groups of people, which is what we call class actions. So you work with a particular group or maybe groups of lawyers? That's right, Amanda. We So for each action, whether it's a, a class action brought on behalf of a large number of people or a single claim brought on behalf of one claimant, There will always be a lawyer that represents the claimant or the group of claimants. And we work with a number of law firms who bring those actions. And in the case of the current combustible cladding class action, we're working closely with the lawyers, William Roberts lawyers, and the partner there with conduct of the matter, Bill Petrovsky. Okay, let's get into that. What is this combustible cladding class action all about and why should it matter to the people listening to this podcast? Well, breaking it down, Amanda, uh, so firstly, it is a class action, which means it's brought on behalf of a large number of people. We commenced the proceeding in the Federal Court of Australia in Sydney in February this year, so it's 
at a relatively early stage. The class action is brought on behalf of everybody in Australia, so it's nationwide, that has certain types of Aluka bond cladding fitted to their buildings within the last 10 years. And the cladding concerned is, it's often referred to as polyethylene or PE core cladding. And the two products that are subject to the class action are called Aluka bond PE and Aluka bond plus. And it's a product liability claim against the manufacturers of those products, 3A Composites, which is a German company, and Halifax Vogel Group, which is an Australian company. And in essence, what is alleged, and we will have to prove, but what we say is that the products don't comply with the Australian consumer law because they're not safe and are not fit for purpose because the polyethylene core is combustible and gives rise to a risk of uh, fire spread and severe fire. And principally what we're seeking to do on behalf of all affected property owners is recover compensation comprising the cost to remove and replace the cladding concerned. And depending on the type of building, that cost, financial cost, is likely to be significant and is ultimately borne by the owners corporation and therefore the strata unit owners in the in a residential strata building but it also applies to commercial buildings and public buildings okay lots of questions uh, from from my part arising from that first of all for our listeners if you're not across the cladding issue, which if you're a long-term listener to this podcast and involved in the strata sector, you probably are. But there's a really good introduction to this back in episode 103, where I was talking to Linda Kipriadakis from the ABMA. And Linda gave, I felt, a really easy to understand explanation of what this cladding is and why in certain circumstances, not all, it shouldn't be on our buildings. So head back and listen to episode 103 if you want an introduction there to that. You've mentioned there, Gavin, both the owners' corporation being the building, let's call them, and also the owners. Who are your clients or William Roberts' clients or the claimants in this circumstance? Are they the buildings or are they the lot owners? It's a good question, Amanda. So a good example is in the current class action, there's there's one applicant which brings the action on its own behalf and on behalf of everybody else. And the representative applicant is an owner's corporation of a residential building in Sydney. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is typically in a residential building, the cladding is either part of the external wall or attached to an external wall and is therefore owned by the owner's corporation. So the proper claimant is in that situation is the owner's corporation. And that owner's corporation then seeks to recover the cost of removing and replacing the cladding. But ultimately, that financial cost is borne by the strata unit owners by way of levy raised by the owner's corporation. Mm. So on the one hand, the proper entity to bring the claim is the owner's corporation. But ultimately, the financial burden is borne by the lot owners. And you've mentioned there that it is a product liability claim that you're making against the manufacturers of the Aluka Bond product. So it is not a claim against the developer or the original builder. If you're in a a new building and you're saying, well, this is a defect, it's something quite separate from that. You're actually saying, correct me if I'm wrong, this product should never have been sold for Australian buildings. That's a good summary of what we say, Amanda. I must stress at this stage, there have been no findings by the court. So it's allegations that we make in the court documents, but that's right. And picking up on what you say about builders and developers, it may also be open to owners' corporations to pursue separate claims against builders and construction professionals, as was seen, for example, in the case of the lacrosse tower in Melbourne. But what we're doing is something different to that. And the only thing that 
claimants can't do is recover the same compensation twice. So they could pursue their own separate action against builders and developers and construction professionals if they chose. They could also participate in our combustible cladding cast action if they are eligible to do so. And as I say, the, there's no bar to participating in both, uh, but the only thing they cannot do is recover the same compensation twice. Okay. What makes a building eligible to participate in this class action? In the court documents, there's a definition of the group members. So the list of people that fall within this class action. And in short, that's everybody that has a property interest in a building that has a Luca Bond PE or a Luca Bond Plus, and that cladding was supplied within the last 10 years. So what we do at an early stage for everybody who has reg already registered with us and for any new registrants, we ask for information that will enable us to make an early evaluation as to eligibility to participate in the class action. So the key things arise from that is the type of cladding that is fitted to the building and when it was supplied. They're, I suppose they're the two key questions. And the, the current class action, as I say, concerns two Aluka Bond cladding products, but we are investigating other cladding products. And so we're also encouraging people to register because often building owners don't know what type of cladding they have. Mm. So the short answer to that is to register with us and we'll help you work it out. And that will enable us to, one, determine whether or not the building's eligible to participate in the current class action, but if not, whether or not it's eligible to participate in other class actions that we're contemplating. Mm -hmm. And we will get into how to register and where our listeners need to go if they want to register. Are you finding that question, for those who have registered and you're then working through that question with them, do you have this cladding and was it installed within the last 10 years? Is that a difficult question for buildings to answer, are you finding, or it's pretty straightforward? It's mixed, Amanda. Sometimes it's very easy, sometimes it's very difficult. So, for example, Google searches can readily determine when a building was constructed, for example, if it was a new build. Mm. That's one way to determine when the cladding was likely to have been supplied. There may be construction documents that are available to the building owner or the owner's corporation, which we ask to be provided, again, which might shed light on the type of cladding and the date of construction. But often, as was seen in the Lacrosse Tower litigation, sometimes a particular type of cladding is specified in the construction documents, but ultimately a different product is used. Mm -hmm. So we have already engaged a number of building experts to assist our funded clients, that's those who have signed up with us, to work out precisely what type of cladding they have on their building. Mm. And you cover the costs of that? We do if the it's a quid pro quo of signing our funding agreement so if i know we're going to talk about the registration process but if ultimately an owner's corporation or a building owner signs our funding agreement that's one of the benefits okay are you able to say gavin how many group members how many buildings you have registered with you and involved in this class action today Amanda, the, the information that all of our registrants provide to us uh, is confidential. I mean, that's another one of the benefits is, as I'm sure you appreciate, often a building owner with combustible cladding wants to be compensated, wants something to be done, but doesn't want it generally to be known that the building has combustible cladding. Well, other than our lead applicant whose identity is disclosed on the court documents, the group members so the other buildings that participate, their identity is not disclosed generally. So I'm not at liberty to say precisely how many we've got. Sure. Uh, but I, what I can say is a significant number of buildings have already registered with us. Mm. 
Just on that point about not necessarily wanting to disclose publicly that your building might have this cladding in place, there is obviously a, a question there about devaluation of properties. Is that a component of your claim before the court? You've mentioned there you're claiming the costs of having to remove the cladding, uh, replace it with something else, no doubt. What about that potentially lost property value? Principally, if the cladding is removed and replaced, then you'd expect no diminution in property value. So the, as I said before, the, the principal compensation sought is for the cost to remove and replace the cladding. The proceedings are relatively early stage and it remains to be seen whether or not any individual building, there's any diminution in property value of the, the building or the lots within it, because you'd expect if the cladding concerned is removed and replaced, then that would remove any claim for diminution in property value. So presently, the class action is focusing on the principal problem, which is to seek to have the the remedy being the compensation to remove and replace the cladding. Perhaps I should say in that context, we're not bringing claims on behalf of individual apartment owners, as I said, because the cladding's typically affixed to the common property and therefore the proper claimants are the owner's corporation. You've mentioned there, Gavin, this concept that there can be no double dipping, which makes sense. Uh, We can't be compensated twice, for example, by the developer and then by the manufacturer. Are you involved at all with insurers, building insurers, and are you aware, you may not be, of what their position has been when it comes to this cladding? Um, My understanding is that there's been a bit of confusion and some grey areas in our sector when it comes to strata building insurers and the question of cladding. Have you had any interaction with them, any involvement when you're working with these buildings? Yes. The, our position is that, or our understanding is that a building with building insurance, the insurers will not make a payment to the building owner unless there's been some property damage and So absent a fire, so unlike lacrosse, for most buildings that have not fortunately suffered a fire, but nevertheless may still be obliged to remove and replace the cladding because it's, for example, in New South Wales, subject to the building product use ban. Those insurers, whilst they won't pay to remove and replace the cladding, having been notified that a building is affected, and typically we see a significant increase in insurance premiums for that building. Mm-hmm. And that is another head of compensation that we see to recover in the class action, the increased insurance premiums. Lacrosse, by contrast, where there was a fire and therefore property damage, therefore triggering cover under the building policy, and as I understand, there was a a payment made by the building's insurers, which it then sought to recover by a claim against the builder. Mm -hmm. But in our class action, fortunately, there have been a limited number of fires to date. Principally, we're looking to recover the cost of replacing the cladding on behalf of buildings that have not suffered a fire, no fire damage, and therefore they're not entitled to turn to their own insurers and recoup the cost of replacing the cladding. And that in itself is a huge cost. I mean, I've just seen uh, colloquially and some buildings that have contacted me showing me some of the quotes that they've obtained. For some large buildings or buildings that have multiple towers, if you like, we're talking millions of dollars. This is huge money. That's correct, Amanda. And again, as part of our registration process for everybody who registers, that's further information that we ask, not only type of cladding and who supplied it and when, but have you received any notice from any local authority in effect requiring the owner's corporation to take action? And that action can have multiple steps, but ultimately ending with quotations for the cost to remove and replace the cladding. And depending on the building, we've seen quotations ranging from $500,000 to multi-millions of dollars. 
Mm, it is scary stuff, and that is why I believe it's so important that buildings and managers who are listening to this episode understand what it is that IMF Bentham and William Roberts lawyers are doing with this class action. Now let's get into that registration process. What do our buildings do if they want to register? Visit our website, imf.com.au, and on that website there's a dedicated page for the combustible cladding class action. Mm -hmm. That firstly provides further information about the class action and possible other class actions as I've outlined today, but then there's a link to register anybody's interest. I should stress that that registration is one, confidential, and two, it's with no obligation. So there's no financial obligation to anybody who registers their interest. Once interest has been registered by providing us with some basic information, our client team in Perth will then send on a confidential basis an information pack to every registrant and that pack contains a number of documents including our funding agreement, William Roberts retainer and costs agreement and a document that we prepared which answers a number of frequently asked questions. So another benefit of registering with no obligation is to provide out, be provided with further information about what we're doing. And then upon receipt of the confidential information pack, we encourage people to sign up. And when I say sign up, I mean sign the funding agreement and sign William Roberts' cost and retainer agreement and then return them to us. That's all explained as part of the process online. And just to stress there that a question that we've been frequently asked is, well, what obligation do I have once I've signed up? Well, what we're finding is people are signing up and some have a LUCA bond and some do not. For those that do not have a LUCA bond, the PE and PLUS products, they're, of course, not eligible to participate in the current class action. There's no financial obligation on those people who, for whatever reason, we assess they're not eligible to participate. So there's no downside, as it were, by signing up. But if somebody signs up and they don't have a LUCA bond, it may be that they have another product that we're also investigating. And once somebody signs up and becomes a funded client of IMF, we have building experts who will assist us at no cost to the owner to determine what type of cladding is fitted to the building, to assess eligibility to participate in the current class action or any others. And so that benefit is at no cost to the signed up owner. So the process in short is online registration and sign up. And then our client team will assist me to collate the information so we can work out eligibility to participate. Okay. And it is Buildings Australia wide. So it doesn't matter uh, where you are. Head over and check out that registration link. I will put a direct link to the registration page in the show notes for this episode. So you'll also find it over at yourstrataproperty.com.au forward slash podcasts where you see this podcast episode. Now, a question which may be answered in your material, Gavin, or is one of your frequently asked questions, what steps does a building need to take? And I'm recognizing this is going to be probably different in each jurisdiction to legally engage you or it's probably William Roberts more appropriately to represent them in this action. And I'm thinking general meetings, resolutions. Certainly in the case of a residential strata building with an owner's corporation, there is a process. The process varies from state to state. But again, William Roberts can assist because that's a legal process. Uh, they can assist with providing some guidance on the process in any particular jurisdiction. So, for example, in New South Wales, William Roberts assisted our representative applicants, owners corporation, with the process, which resulted in then a meeting of the committee and resolutions were passed, which enabled the owners corporation to then enter into the our funding agreement and William Roberts' cost and retainer agreement. So, yes, there is a process, but it typically involves notice of a meeting, 
a meeting, a quorum, a vote, and then signing up. Yep. I am not aware, maybe you are, Gavin, has there ever been a class action headed up by a strata building, an owners corporation, a body corporate? Not that I'm aware of, mm. Amanda. This is Australia's first combustible cladding class action. Mm. I don't know whether or not there have been class actions not involving combustible cladding brought by an owner's corporation, mm. but certainly it's a first in relation to combustible cladding. Yeah, and it does open up those questions about retainers and authority uh, and instructions that I'm sure you're all having lots of fun with there with <laughs> William Roberts trying to work through all that. Yes, well, that, that's really what we're here for. It's so unlike, say, a shareholder class action where it's a more straightforward signing up process for buildings with an owner's corporation the process is less straightforward, but nevertheless, there is a process and we're finding that it can be achieved in a relatively short time frame with some guidance. Mm. Clearly, there are claims against builders and developers that are bought by individual buildings. So they've been through that process to pursue their own litigation mm. and indeed may be currently doing so about cladding. So whatever the process is, it can be achieved. Yep, for sure. Now, what happens if a building is not registered with you but does have a Luca Bond cladding? Do they get the benefit should you be successful in this litigation? The short answer to that is it will depend. The, it's, the class action has been commenced as an open one and what that means is it's brought on behalf, as I say, of all affected buildings as defined in the court papers. And that means everybody is in mm. unless they opt out. And there's a statutory right to opt out. And later in the proceedings, there will be a, a court approved notice, which has to be sent to all of the members of the class or directly or indirectly by way of advertisement. If we don't know at that time precisely who's in the class advising them as to their right to opt out. And if they opt out, then they're no longer in. But if they don't opt out, they remain in the proceeding. And ultimately, the court may require a formal registration process where building owners have to put their hand up to say, here I am, and I wish to participate in any settlement. But we're nowhere near that process yet. So I expect at some point, the court will require building owners to reveal themselves to us. But this is why we're preempting that with our own registration process. So we'd encourage people to register with us so we know that you exist now rather than later. And this is one of the problems that has arisen from there being presently no publicly available list of affected buildings in Australia. And there are moves afoot for there to be such a publicly available register. But in the meantime, there isn't. So the only way we can find out about affected buildings is on an ad hoc basis from what we read in the press, but principally by encouraging people to register and then we know that their building exists. Yep. And they will, by registering with us, automatically we're aware of their details to include in any uh, resolution process down the track. Yep. From my perspective, I don't see a downside in engaging in that registration process, taking that first step. If you're aware that you have uh, some kind of PE cladding installed or you're just not sure, it sounds like a good first step to me and to start engaging in that uh, investigation process and, and to open up the conversation. If you're a lot owner or a committee member and you want to find out more with no obligation, sounds like a good way to do it and to get that information pack to then be able to share with your strata manager, with your fellow committee members and see if you are able to take the next step. That's it. And that's really on a final note, we would encourage people to register or if they've got any further questions, just to contact us directly. But the registration process is confidential and with no obligations. So encourage people to continue to do that. 
Well, thank you so much, Gavin, for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, when I discovered you out there, I uh, shifted a few things around to make sure we could talk as quickly as possible. So I'm sure it's important that you get these registrants on board uh, as soon as you can. As I said, I will put a link in the show notes to where you need to go to find out more about the class action and to register. Is there anything that you want to add, Gavin, before we wrap up? I think that's covered it all, Amanda. I'd just like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to make more people aware that this class action and possible other class actions in relation to combustible cladding are being investigated by us and William Roberts. And really the the point that you touched on, just to confirm, regardless of whether or not you know what type of cladding you've got, register with us and we'll help you work it out. Sounds good. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you for listening to Your Strata Property, the podcast which consistently delivers to property owners reliable and accurate information about their strata property. You can access all the information below this episode via the show notes at www.yourstrataproperty.com.au. You can also ask questions in the comments section, which Amanda will answer in her upcoming episodes. How can Amanda help you today? today?